and welcome to the LA Venture Podcast. This is Minnie Ingersoll, host of the podcast and partner at 10110. 10110 is a seed stage fund here in LA. All opinions expressed on this show by me and my guests are solely our own. Gil Elbaz is one of my partners and co-founder of 10110. He was also the founder of Factual, a location data company, and Applied Semantics, the company that built AdSense. AdSense took him to Google, where he led Google's LA office, and of course, he is a Caltech grad. Go Beavers. Uh, Kill, thank you for hiring me at 10110 and for coming on the podcast today. Thank you. We, we get a lot of time to talk, but this time we're being recorded. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> I hope so. So I've had David and Eric and I have actually all been on the podcast, and we've talked about sort of making million dollar investments into seed stage tech focused startups. So with you, I thought I would start with Applied Semantics. Let's go for it. Cool. So yeah, maybe just start with what was Applied Semantics. And I'm really curious of your fundraising journey and like what did Applied Semantics look like when you raised your your seed round? Well, Applied Semantics was a natural language understanding technology company. We built a lot of products. We, we were sort of always in search of product market fit. Uh, we eventually stumbled on AdSense. We built AdSense. That became our certainly our claim to fame. When we were in the right place at the right time, and Google had its eyes on further monetizing their ad network, and uh, so it, it added up well. And we were very very happy to be in Google's crosshairs because that became a terrific acquisition. Yeah. In fact, I don't really know your funding history. How far along were you when you raised your your first round of funding? I had done a good job of saving money working up in Silicon Valley before I moved to LA. I, I was able to pay the bills for about nine months. Uh, we had a team of 10 or 15, very low paid people actually. Um, right, no, hire your brother, your younger brother, <laughs> not pay him much. That was a clever way of getting getting started. Yeah, I mean, a brother, a cousin, a roommate. I mean, you know, there were a bunch of people that were all living together in the same house. And did you have AdSense was, or... What was working when you raised your capital? The original application was search and we built a search engine and the seed round was definitely raised on the idea that we could compete against Google. And at that time in 1999, they didn't have a lot of users yet. They didn't have a lot of traffic and we were getting attention and they were getting attention. Um, that ended up not growing nearly as fast as Google. That's okay. We had an AdSense product that, that helped us raise the Series A, although it wasn't generating money at that time, but I think that the idea was very big and attracted capital. Hmm. And it was called, your product was called AdSense, wasn't it? It was. I mean, I think Aton had a lot to do with inventing the idea, but I distinctly remember that my co-founder, Adam Weissman, came up with a name. He liked the fact that it was a triple entendre, not just double. So it was a good name. It stuck. And, and then it grew into, you know, tens of billions. I don't know. It's some large percentage of Google's revenue, right? Yes. I mean, it is in the tens of billions. When we got acquired in 2003, we thought we thought we had really built an amazing network. It was in the tens of millions. Hmm. Uh, we were profitable. We were very, very impressed with ourselves. Uh, I, I mean, I knew that Google's distribution network would enable it to grow, but I had no idea of the potential scale. Okay. So you were profitable. I didn't know that. So you were profitable, but didn't you get down to, you know, having no money in the bank again, or? It, it definitely. So we only raised, well, in, in our 2000 series A, we raised 5.2 million. That was kind of standard back then. People usually raise money to last one to two years. And uh, then you had with the dot-com bust, there was no more, there wasn't going to be any more raising money for a while. So we really had to stretch it. We had to stretch it three years in order to make our ends meet. But but there were, yeah, there was definitely a point in time where we had to get to profitability. There was very little money in the bank. We unfortunately had to lay off seven people, which at the time just seemed just awful and a traumatic experience for, for all of us that had built this close-knit family and built this company. But we had to do what we had to do in order to, to make it. Wow. So you went from laying off seven people to, I think it was Google's largest acquisition for 1% of the company or 1% of Google or something, right? I mean, it was one of the first acquisitions. I mean, I think Blogger, Blogger. came just before, but uh, yeah, it was, the, it was one of the first and the most significant at the time. Yeah. What did they want when, what did Google want when they acquired you? Yeah, I, I think I had understood that they believed that AdSense which is all the, all the ads that aren't on the Google homepage. So they understood that the rest of the advertising ecosystem was a big opportunity. So that was way up there. I think they liked the idea of having a, a presence in LA. They had no presence and we became 
Mm -hmm. We were Google Santa Monica, but now it's you, you think of it as Google LA because it's a little bit more widespread. Uh, and then we had a very googly culture. Yeah, I remember those early days. I remember when you guys were acquired. Um, do you remember like Omid like standing on sandbags? Literally, it was like a bean bag. You know, I spent most of my time in LA. I went to a, a, few, a few of the Google All Hands. What did you take away from Google? What were some of the big things that stuck with you? Well, first and foremost, uh, I mean, th this culture around values, uh, values that can proliferate through an organization and enable an organization that even at, even at a very large size can still act like a startup. I think it's all on the foundation of teaching people how executives would think if they were in the room hmm. and, and teaching people that the user experience is the most important thing and the, the whole don't be evil slogan and thinking about things at scale. And, and there was a lot of talk about don't build, don't build a, a prototype that's just English only. If it can't scale to global languages and regions, that it's, it's not going to be very valuable. Yeah. How about don't be evil? Um, yeah. So don't be evil. I thought it came up a lot as a guiding principle, especially in the early days. Like, do you, does it sadden you at all? Or do, are you concerned? Like, I think a lot of people would say, oh, big tech has gotten evil or. Uh, let's see. I mean, one of the things that I've learned is the genius of clever marketing. And <laughs> there's a lot underlying this concept of don't be evil, but you can't say everything that you want to say in a, in a value statement or a tagline or a slogan. So there's sort of a genius to coming up with the right soundbite that catches. Yeah. The genius of marketing, Gil, that's, I, I didn't expect to hear that. I thought we'd talk about, you know, big data sets. I like that. Yeah, I've definitely been on a journey at Google and post Google in terms of learning about the power of storytelling. I always mm. heard about how Southern California has this talent here for storytelling and it wasn't my world at all. And I'm still on a learning journey around uh, how to create emotional attachment from the messages that companies send. Cool. So then you went to start Factual. Yeah, I was just dying to do it again. I mean, I loved Google, but I don't think there's anything like having a team. It's your group, your connected at the hip, taking on the world to mm. achieve some mission and you're doing it together and you have each other's backs and you care about each other and you care about the mission. There's just nothing like succeeding together and also sometimes failing together and having to figure out how to, to take a U-turn. I love that. Eric said that, that you, you gave some speech about that that inspired him and that's like why he joined 10110. So tell us more, tell me more about Factual. I know, I know some of it. Strangely, data was just a passion <laughs> and an addiction, almost an addiction that I had from my earliest memories. I mean, I had to wait to be driven to a library to get things answered. And I just love facts. Finally, in 1981, we were one of the first families in the, I think in the country to get cable TV. And so with cable TV, I had streaming stock market data, streaming weather data, and then sports. I mean, and I, these are the three things that I fell in love with. Baseball, weather data, stock market data. And I, I literally graphed this data. I know it's quirky as a, like, oh, a 10 year old. Yes, quirky, but consistent. <laughs> Tell me more about what Factual is. The original idea with Factual would be, was that it would be the go-to destination if you want to access high quality data and for it to just be seamless and easy. And the, the metaphor might be the, the Amazon of data where you could just go in there and everything's there for you. Or maybe we also thought about it being a little bit more like the Wikipedia of data in a sense that it wasn't completely 100% commercial. There would be a lot of contributions because the world would have a desire for correct information to be illuminated. And so we worked on that for a while. When we launched, we did have 600,000 different data sets that we automatically extracted from various sources. But what we learned is maybe the time wasn't right for the, the Amazon or the Wikipedia of data. We understood that our customers wanted to know that we had a deep focus. If we talked to a hospital and we came in talking about health data, but on our homepage, there was data about Tiger Woods and all the championships, he won. It somehow, somehow it wasn't working from an enterprise storytelling marketing level. Mm -hmm. So at some point we realized we can succeed if we choose a vertical. And we realized that location data in itself is going to be a, a massive multi-billion dollar opportunity. Just understanding how to stitch the online and offline worlds. What is at every point on the globe? What's the significance of being at a certain spot? What's happening there? What what restaurants are there? What businesses there? What do people do there? What are the hours of operation? Uh, and, and and on and on and on. Yeah, who else has that data today? 
Well, Google, of course, has built their own POI, places of interest data set, as part of the Google Maps product. And they, they do have an API, but they're not very focused on providing that data to support and enable other companies. So that created our opportunity to create a Google quality places data set, but be very, very laser focused on helping every other big tech company and every other Fortune 500 company. Okay, so you have this data set that maybe only Google has something as good. Yeah, I mean, there were, there were a couple other, I mean, depending on the country, as far as global, there, were, there was another company, also a company who was founded by someone that was at Google with me, whose own company has been acquired, and that's Dennis Crowley. And we kind of lived these parallel lives where we sold our companies to Google, and we both raised money from Andreessen at the same time. And so I'm talking about Foursquare. Yep. And uh, to cut the story 12 years short, uh, I had become close friends and really respected the culture at Foursquare, which for me is maybe more important than anything else. And, uh, and so after lots of discussion, we ended up merging these companies together and forming what we think is the, the powerhouse, the location platform powerhouse. Mm -hmm. And you do this, I think, not to put words in your mouth, but I think you do this because one, you think, you know, the data unlocks innovation, but also it sort of creates competition, right? Well, first and foremost, we're doing it to enable innovation across a whole realm of different use cases. I do personally think that it's an issue when one company has a monopoly on information and has too much power and they become the data have, and then there's a lot of have nots. And I think it really slows down development and innovation. Um, yeah. But what's the sort of creepy factor? How do you avoid, you know, potential downside of having this data? Well, I don't think there's, I don't think there's any downside as long as consumers have control of their own data. Uh, I mean, as far as businesses go, businesses want to be found out. They want to be, restaurants want all of this information to be uh, surfaced into a whole range of applications. Uh, so businesses want to be found out. And as far as consumers, consumers want the opportunity to opt in and share their, their location with businesses that they trust so that they can get better services. So uh, the hardest part, I think, is just getting people to share the data. So consumer control was your answer, which is as long as consumers have control, uh, I actually don't know GDPR and CCPA all that well. Like, are they doing a good job of, of forcing consumers to sort of opt in, opt out, that sort of stuff? I think GDPR has moved the ball in the right direction and, and set a good precedent for the rest of the world in terms of what it means, what does opt-in mean, and how there's stricter requirements around that the pop-up itself has to provide some explanation for what's going to happen with your data and who's going to get your data. You also, it used to be that you could get away with a contract where the contract requires, let's say, someone to make sure that all data that's being transacted was opted in. But now there's a much higher uh, requirement for auditing your supply. Like if you're working with a partner, they better have gotten opt-in and you better check and, and audit that supply and make sure that everything's on the up and up. Uh, so I, I think it was a, a positive thing for the industry that the regulatory environment is catching up with what consumers deserve. I just suspect there's so many consumers like me who just click wherever they can just to make the pop-up go away. I mean, that, that's fair that there's going to be some number of people that, that don't read I think I would agree with you, and it is difficult to take the time, the adequate time to understand. There's this company that's offering me the ability, take Uber. They're saying that if I share my location with them, they will promptly pick me up. You know, but, but what else are they doing with the data? I trust them, I, I use them. But to read all of the legalese is really beyond most of our capabilities. And also it's in incredibly time consuming and people are using new services all the time. I do think ultimately we need AI agents that act on our behalf, that understand what our motivations are. Like, do you want to just be given money for monetizing your data? Do you want better user experiences? What companies do you inherently trust? Ultimately, I think we need AIs to make these decisions for us. And I do think that if humans released control of certain decisions to AIs, it would free up so much human time for more human endeavors. I hope we don't have to spend all of our time being lawyers and reading privacy statements. So I have my personal AI that reads the privacy policies for me and makes the pop-ups go away. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, there's many, there's many other things that this AI could do. They could be, and there are other, there are already products out there that might be, let's say, looking for, uh, they know that you want to go visit South America and they're looking for 
a, a cheap ticket that, that becomes available, that meets your parameters. There are already AIs like that that are searching the internet to help you out. But I think we've only scratched the surface on that. Agreed. So you have a quirky love of data. You also have strong opinions on what you look for in a founder. Can you talk some about those? When I talk to a founder, I'm certainly looking for persistence. I, I enjoy working with people who are addicted enough to solving a particular problem that they can't really, they couldn't really imagine stopping regardless of the kind of roadblock that they hit. Mm. And, uh, and I do like talking about uh, what I see as a 10 year journey. It is possible that if you get, if, if you build a great team and you hit the market just right, it could inflect very quickly and power to you. But I think that an entrepreneur has to go in assuming that it's gonna take years before the market appreciates this incredible vision, that, that actually it's gonna be a full 10 years until you get through the entire cycle of finding product market fit. And if, if you're not in it for 10 years and people around you will see these cracks, they'll see that you're not gonna be able to withstand challenges. And it's, it's, all, it's an inevitably a roller coaster. I think if you have the 10 year patience and grit and persistence, you're going to attract, you're going to be a magnet for talent. You're going to attract capital. And I think it's almost magic. The other thing I think that's magic is people talk about how unlikely it is that a seed stage company makes it to, let's say, unicorn status. I actually think there's a bunch of reasons why I think the data is flawed. And that if you only look at people that will not quit no matter what, they'll sleep in the sleeping bag on the street if they have to, they will not stop working, they will not sell the company, they will not do anything except continue talking about it, working on it for 10 years. And I've, I've mathematically figured this out. It's about 100,000 interactions over 10 years. Those, are, those interactions might be phone calls, emails. If you 100,000 times in a row, do your best to do the right thing, follow your values, give it a decent effort. Don't kill yourself, just give it a decent effort. Don't act like this conversation isn't important. Take it seriously, just do the right thing 100,000 times in a row. I think it's actually magical how much distance you gain and how many people aren't as committed to that and how many people fall off. I, I mean, at Applied Semantics, a lot of our competitors just, we just outlasted them and they just, uh, we don't know where they went. They, they had technology that seemed as good as ours, maybe, but they're not, they're not around anymore. I've heard you talk about this with passion, it's great. Do you remember your John Muir Trail analogy? Yeah, so at Caltech, it, it's a good school, you know, but uh, it's not known for their athletics. And so I had never run a mile in my life, ever. I didn't, I didn't know that. <laughs> until my junior year in college. I think in high school, they wanted us to run a mile, but I think I didn't show up to school that day or something. But somehow I decided that I'm going to join the cross country team. And at Caltech, I was allowed to my junior year. <laughs> so the summer before my junior year, I killed myself. I got very sick many times because I, I, I guess when you run 10 or 12 miles a day and you've never done it before, it, it's hard on my body. I got sick a lot, but I did stay with the team and I did manage to, I, there was one meet that I wasn't sick at. But our, the most important, interesting thing about the story is our coach was the world's best ultra marathoner at the time, Jim O'Brien. And he ran hundred mile races and he won them. And the one that I was part of uh, was the Angeles Crest hundred miler. And he was so far ahead of second place. His time was so, so much earlier than they anticipated anybody finishing the race. They didn't even have the finish line set up, but it was just very inspiring. And it turns out somebody running a hundred mile race has to take right, right around a hundred thousand steps. It's like right in that order of magnitude. Got it. I think. So if you're willing to do a hundred thousand emails or take a hundred thousand steps and sleep on the street, then you could have a successful startup or run ultra marathons. Yeah. Which in a way is a super easy recipe that I think a lot of people could do, but it does take a, a tremendous amount of willpower, I guess, to do something a hundred thousand times in a row and not give up. Uh, just to be clear, when I gave Eric Pakravan that, when I did that talk and talk about that yeah. years ago, you mentioned that Eric heard, heard that he was there at USC. Um, a lot of people afterwards were really impressed that I was this entrepreneur and also a hundred mile runner. <laughs> I'm actually not. I, I mean, I have the persistence when it comes to com founding companies. I, I didn't quite make it to uh, ultra marathon status. Yeah, no, I think it's great though, because I think a lot of people in like the college setting or, or MBA students, let's say like, well, there isn't that much downside to being an entrepreneur right now. Like you can, it, there's, it's less risky than it used to be and you don't have to pay yourself nothing. And the problem is it's 10 years of your life. And so that's fine as long as 
you're 32 today and you're prepared to be 42. Yeah. So yeah, you might think, oh, there's not a lot of downside to me dabbling with something. But yeah, I think if you if you're dabbling, you've cut your chance of success by, I don't know, a very, very large number. And a lot of people don't have the 10 years to commit to it. And that's understandable. And I have respect for people that want other kind of jobs and add value in other ways. And a lot of people can make, can do very well and be happy and successful. But I think there is that more unique individual that realizes that they were put on the earth to do this thing. And 10 years is what? Only an eighth of your adult life? Yeah. Well, but then you don't get to do some other thing if you're doing this thing. And you described it as sleeping on the street. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's worth considering. Um, yeah. How many years were you a founder CEO? Many years. Yeah, so over 20. So you wanted to riff on the um, the podcast episode with Omar, where he talked about Sequoia celebrating or not celebrating the, the YouTube exit. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that chat with uh, Omar very much. Uh, it just it just gave me something to think about when he was talking about YouTube. To what degree do you show support for entrepreneurs that feel like they do want to sell early? Or do you make them feel bad about making this, this personal decision? And as much as we want our companies to go very, very long, I think the best formula for that is actually building a brand around supporting the entrepreneur and helping them on their journey. I think when an entrepreneur feels really supported and feels like they have people around them that they show a lot of empathy, it actually frees them up to, to sometimes take more risk. I think that I, I like to think that's a formula that's worked for us. What about the notion that to support them best, you have to give them tough love? Yeah, I mean, I think you're you're incredible and a type A mini, and you seem to be very good at uh, at providing the structure that that people need. I guess I guess we each have our strengths. For me, I think I grew up with parents that their their lesson in life was motivation is everything. Mm. You know, you can't be forced. My parents didn't make me study piano, and that didn't work. I took it for <laughs> one year. I told my parents, I don't like practicing. And they said, said, okay, let's find something else that you love. Was that the right answer? I sometimes complain to them later. You should have made me study piano. I would have, you know, I would have been the life of the party. But, um, but they were all about figuring out how to tie somebody in with what they love, with passion, so that there's inherent internal motivation. And so that's why I, I think so much about motivation, incentive, passion, love. Wow. So how do we, how do we help our entrepreneurs though with motivation or is that just something that they have to find? I think they have to come with it. They have to find, but I think we can support it. And I think, I think there's ways to put out that internal motivation. I think we have to support it and grow it and, and enhance it. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, well, this is good. So, uh, do we need to talk more about 10 one or can we just delve into like you and your parents and, um, your brother? Uh, let, what, what direction do you want to go? We only have a few more minutes. Topics. Let's talk about, okay. Um, so Aton, let's talk about Aton. Um, how, describe how you and Aton are the same or different. I think we're, we're pretty different. Um, you know, we both studied engineering, but Aton was the born salesperson. Um, I mean, I love things that take a little bit longer, investing in culture, strategy, technology. I think he's incredible when it comes to things that he can get done fast, aggressively reaching out to hire somebody, raising money, making tough decisions. Uh, I don't know, it's somehow the, the metaphor of the tortoise and hare sort of, you know, <laughs> like, so like you there's a, I think there's, the, the reason that there is that fable is because there is a gener general bias that faster is better. But, you know, I kind of represent a little bit of the, the tortoise, like do the right thing again and again for 10 years. And so not to take anything away from, from him. I love the guy and we've gotten along so well. And I was extremely lucky to have a brother that was also interested in the same things that I was with the startup and to be able to, to found a company with him. Yeah. It's interesting. You are soft-spoken. I would call you soft-spoken, but very strong-willed. Would you agree with that? I think so. Uh, people have... Um, yeah, I, I, I think I, I, I agree. I agree with that. I, I'm very, very stubborn. Well, okay. Strong will might be, but like you have a strong sense of values and direction and where you're going that I think people who don't know you well, but yeah, go on. Well, I think there's certain attributes that there are certain attributes that there's a bias in our society toward valuing. So for example, if you follow Myers-Briggs, your classic CEO is probably ENTJ, you know, extroverted, a fast decision maker. I mean, these are the things that are classically 
valued. And I think, I think that there's a lot of value in a, in P in perceiving the world and more slowly working to understand it so that you know that you're choosing the right approach and the right strategy. Yeah. Um, in my remaining two minutes with you, I kind of like to touch on X prize. You've been on the board of X prize for a long time now. Yeah, for a, dec a decade and a half. So I just loved this X prize model of incentivizing, of creating an incentive prize and having a big pile of money to give to whoever solves the problem. Mm. Uh, it's, it's opposite of the Nobel prize where 20 years after you contribute something to the world, you're recognized for it. That's great too, nothing wrong with that, but I, it's not an incentive prize. It doesn't sort of wake people up to go solve issues. And I mean, it's just amazing to see um, the kind of impact X Prize has had working on global literacy, ocean cleanup, or uh, a cancer prize. Yeah. You know, it's endless. I mean, I mean, how many problems do we have? A lot. Yeah, and it's a fun way to get to spend your free time. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, Gil, I really admire how you operate, and I'm glad I get to work with you. And uh, Anne, thank you for coming on the podcast. This has been fun. Thanks, Minnie. Real quick, it would be great if you could spare a moment to give the podcast five stars or share with a friend, or I love getting emails. Send me a note, mini at 10110.net. Thanks.